All right, guys. So I don't know what order you are watching this in. Uh, it, you know, we are all releasing this at the same time, Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the interview that we had had with Peter Beck and Adam Spice. And all I can say is that when I was just sitting there, the quality of the questions coming from these three other gentlemen and myself, I'll just toot my own horn there for a second, are just phenomenal, right? I wish we were on the earnings call. I think a lot of people would get a lot of value out of it, but maybe we're diving a little bit too technical, uh, you know, for, for some. I mean, we're not talking about equations on this call or anything like that, but the opportunity to hear the future that we have in front of us with Rocket Lab is absolutely astonishing. Uh, I was able to ask questions with respect to is Neutron going to be ready for human space flight? Uh, what's the lock set going to be used for? Is that going to be used in the Gateway program? Uh, what's ETA's thoughts around it and why they're trying to put it into place? Uh, with the with the constellation that they're planning for Rocket Lab, what are the payback periods and break-evens that we're kind of expecting from that? Uh, and, and what kind of uh, gap margins can we kind of expect from the Neutron, right? Uh, we also have the haste missions coming up and asking whether or not that that can be specific to wallops or if that thing if they think that that's going to be the future backlog really that's going to unlock uh based off these three to four additional customers that we have from a defense standpoint uh can we use haste worldwide and you'll be able to hear some of that uh, in there as well there were two other questions that uh, i didn't get to answer kevin i know you asked me this one uh, what is your vision for the space industry in 20 years and where does rocket lab fit Unfortunately, we only had 45 minutes, and so I had to slim down. And I think I answered a little bit about that one with uh, with Peter in the first call, and his answer was really good uh, back in the 1Q time frame. And then somebody else asked, um, oh, no, this one was me. I actually asked this one, so I do have an answer for you guys. This is one that I've been kind of ruffling around in my head. And while we were waiting for everybody to join the call, I actually had a, a comment that I wanted to ask Peter and it's about the, the Archimedes being retrofitted to the Electron. I said, basically, could two or three Archimedes or one Archimedes or what have you be retrofitted to the Electron? I know that the tanks will have to change out and, you know, they're completely different fuels, etc. cetera. Uh, but, you know, what, what could that do? How could that help grow the lift capability? And he says, basically, the Electron is designed, you know, the way it is for, for the way it is. And if you put an Archimedes on it, it'll just turn inside out, basically. And I hope I'm not butchering that. Um, speaking on behalf of Peter, but at the end of the day, um, it made a lot of sense, right? Uh, you know, the Archimedes is about um, two to three times the power of Electron. So uh, if you think about it in that perspective, it's about 18 to 27 Rutherford engines, if you put it in that context, for one. So if you were to try to design it to, to be able to be steerable with a gimbal, etc., you know, and you might have two or however many Archimedes on there, it would just turn itself inside out, right? It, it probably just isn't designed that way. Um, you know, the, the the structure just isn't designed that way. Um, so anyway, just, just some food for thought there. But anyway, um, Dave kindly introduces me uh, with after his series of questions, and then I kindly introduce Scott, and he has a really good follow-up uh, with my haste question. So be sure to check that out on his channel. And if you guys haven't already, be sure to also check out Vince's and Dave's. Uh, but of course, the full interview will be available. I think we're going to release it on Monday, but I have to reconfirm with the guys. I really hope you guys enjoy this interview. Please let me know in the future if there's any questions you think we missed. And I'd also like to hear how you think I showed up uh, comparatively to the other analysts on the call and the earnings call. And as well, um, what favorite question you had of Dave's and what favorite question you had of Scott's and who? Uh, what favorite question you had of Vince's as well? Because I think all these guys showed up extremely well on the call. And I really look forward to hearing your guys' feedback and um, can't wait to hopefully have them on the call. Maybe not next quarter, you know, who knows? You know, we're just lucky to have them on, on the horn at all, but um, really looking forward to the next time. So hope you guys enjoy. Cheers. Um, okay, thanks guys. That was great. I will pass it on to Matt. All right, thanks Dave. Yeah, uh, just wanna say it's been a blast watching you guys over the past three years and you guys have really started to educate me a lot more. Uh, you know, some of the things I'm like, why are they doing that? And it just completely, as we evolve, makes more and more sense over time. So uh, thank you guys for that. It's been a blast for the past three years and I hope it'll be the same fun for the next 30. Um, so let's get Adam involved a little bit here. So for the Rocket Lab owned Constellation, can you guys give a little bit more color on the payback period or expected revenue you guys would receive from those launches, right? Because I'm just trying to think, like, obviously, we're going to try to go to the market at 50 to 60 million for Neutron, maybe more. 
but at, at a cost, right, maybe it's 20 to, to 30 million once we're kind of up and running, uh, assuming kind of like a 50% gap or some, uh, gap margin or something like that. But my thought process is you guys have obviously given thought as to how profitable that constellation would be. My thought process is, is if you're launching your own Neutron, you know, how much and how long would it take to, to kind of pay back what kind of returns you're expecting? That's a good question. I, I think that, you know, the, there's different economics that sort of come into, into play when you think about launching your own stuff, right? So if you look at how a Constellation operator addresses the cost of launch, they typically capitalize that with the cost of the satellite, right? And they amortize that over time or depreciate that over time. Um, you know, the same thing would apply, you know, for us as well. So I think the the the, the satellite economics are going to have to stand on their own. I think the value that we would bring to the table is we'd have, you know, unfettered, you know, access to, to launch. And of course, you know, you know, if we chose to subsidize that for our own intro, we could, we could certainly do that. Um, but at the end of the day, in a, you know, we're going to optimize for, for the overall business. So if somebody, if, if somebody's willing to give us better margin to launch their stuff than to launch our own stuff in the, in the grand scheme of things of all the streams of income, we're going to, we're going to value optimize for what's best for the shareholder. And so right now we really can't tell you what that's going to be. You know, we can kind of look at what the example right now with with with, Sp with SpaceX is right. As Pete mentioned, they launch a tremendous amount of their own stuff, and that comes with a whole bunch of advantages. Because one of the the challenges with operating a, a rocket company or a space company is the fact that there's very very high fixed costs, and fixed cost absorption is a huge driver of profitability and your margin profiles. And so, even if you're not recognizing revenue from an internal launch, you're getting the benefit of that cadence that applies to the launch that you are charging for. And then of course you get the benefit also of having less capitalized costs that gets, you know, kind of taken to the program over time against margin. So lots of goodness happens when you tie launch and kind of constellation ownership together. And I think, you know, we've kind of seen that the way that SpaceX has kind of rolled out their business. Okay. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so that's, that seems a lot of fun. Uh, I guess I did have some questions as well. So going back to the September 2022 Investor Day, right? So going back uh, about two years at this point, there was a not a capsule announcement, but we're looking into it. So I want to ask, basically, is there an opportunity for Neutron to be involved in the Artemis missions in the future? And what is the conclusion of that we're looking into it part? Could the second stage of Neutron be used for astronaut transport? Yeah, I mean... Uh... So we, we the, the reason why we had that there was we're always asked, uh, you know, are you going to do human space flight and, and all the rest of it? And um, so Neutron is is able to be certified for human space flight, um, you know, and the reason why that's important is because you, you, you design the vehicle from day one differently, um, you know, safety factor in, in, you know, tank pressure margins and stuff like that, which are very difficult to go back and, you know, change the safety factor of a tank. So we've we've designed it to be human rateable, um, and we're certainly not uh, certainly not ruling that out. Um, but uh, you know, as as of right now, you know, our view is that there there is there is not really a market. Uh, there's one destination. Uh, there's kind of one and a half suppliers um, already for that one destination. So uh, th there's just no business case to to do it. Um, now, in the future, there could be other destinations and other customers. Um, so we're we're kind of spring loaded to be able to do it. But for right now, uh, it, you know, it just doesn't make sense. But we wanted to make sure that people understood that we're thinking about it. No, that's that's, not that, that's very clear. I appreciate that. That's that's really clean. Um, so, uh, question about the haste missions, and I know that uh, Scotto might have some questions. Well, actually, before that, so I want to talk about the Locksat. So. Um, that that's uh, potentially a technology where you're going to be able to potentially refuel with ETA in the future. Um, so I was wondering, you know, is that going to be potentially used for the future Artemis missions or what is exactly NASA really thinking about that for? Or do you see potential for you guys internally to, to potentially think about using that technology going into the future? Yeah, so our, our, our role in that mission is primarily, uh, um, you know, one... Uh, one of launch and, and also, also kind of hosting, really. Um, so what, what, what NASA are trying to do there is understand long-term storage of cryogenic fluids in orbit, um, mainly for the Gateway program. So if you're hanging out in a kind of a, a pseudo-lunar orbit, um, state, you know, stationing yourself there to go to Mars, you need to be able to hold these cryogenic propellants there for a long period of time. So ETA space has got a you know, a, a method of holding these cryogenic propellants for a long period of time. And 
we're providing the spacecraft and the launch and all of that to, to kind of validate it. So in a lot of respects, it, it's got a similar sort of flavor to it, um, you know, as, as a VADA mission where, you know, they, they have a capsule, um, but we kind of do everything else. Um, so, uh, okay. yeah, that, that, that's really the point of those. That makes sense. And then uh, the last one that I have, and I know Scotto, I think might have some follow up on this one. So we have some se several haste missions between now and the first quarter uh, for multiple different clients. I guess my question is, do you see this being the next unlocker for the larger backlog for Electron and Haste? Because I feel like we've had the one launch in June of 23. It's kind of gone silent, but we have multiple things kind of incoming, right? Three to four different clients that we're going to be looking at. And I feel like that that's going to be the next tranche of backlog that we're going to be adding uh, for, for Electron and Haste. Yeah, so the Haste missions are interesting because um, if you think about that, that we'll call it a market, but it's really a capability, um, it's, it's been completely stifled with um, extremely high cost launch, really infre infrequent test opportunities and wind tunnels that, that you know, you, you book yourself years in advance to get into. So we turn up with a with a rocket that's just ready to go, um, and there's a whole bunch of you know programs and payloads, uh, and you know I would say that 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 whole you know whole community is in is in a state of, you know, uh, what you know how how do we take use of this opportunity as quickly as we can, and right. you know it, changing changing the kind of perspective from it takes me a year to test this thing to we can test this thing next week. Um, you know, is is a different paradigm for all of those organisations and, and government departments to shift to. So uh, it, it's it's been a real enabler for that enabler for that community. And um, look, I think you, you'll see you'll see a lot more happening uh, happening there and in, in, in the near future. Um, I think we've disclosed we have something like um, seven haste launches on backlog already. Um, you know, there's there's a bunch of them coming down the production line. Um, and uh, yeah, as as you mentioned, it's not just you know, one defense customer, it's it's multiple kind of agencies that that are taking advantage of these flight opportunities. Yeah. And and I guess that follows up with, um, I know it's early days, right? But uh, what do you think the capacity could be for Haste specifically? Is it going to be, I guess, competing for Electron sort of slots or is it kind of independent of that? And then second of that question, is that specifically going to only be out of wallops or is there an opportunity for other people around the world at different U.S. bases, et cetera, to be able to use that technology. Yep, no, um, it won't just be out of wallops. Uh, the, it'll be out of other sites as well. Um, and uh, yeah, no, the the it look, we we don't necessarily have a capacity problem, right? We'll just we'll just keep flexing the production line to to keep to keep uh, to get building more. I mean, when when we put the electron production line in place, we we put it in place to support a pretty high cadence. So it, it's not it's not um, you know, it, it's not like we have to buy any machines or any infrastructure. It's just, you know, a few, few more, uh, you know, techs and people to, to, to flex production. So I wouldn't, I would never worry about that um, in that sense. But, um, and then from a, from a, a capacity of the vehicle, it's, it's basically unlimited because we're not, you know, we're, we're only using a, a small amount of the lift of, um, you know, of, of its capability um, when when you take off the second stage or take you know the requirement away to go to orbit, um, you know that the electron can loft anything that they can throw at us. I would just say thank you guys. It's been a blast for the last three years. Can't look forward enough to the next uh, thirty years looking at you guys. Um, thank you again for educating us so much. And I'm gonna hand it over to Scott. Um, I'll just be in the background. Thank you guys again so much. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Um, before we move away from the electron.